Okay. Welcome everyone. We're just going to give give a minute here to let people come in to the session and then we'll get started. All right. Well, I, I don't want to take too much time because uh, we want to give the FOMA all the time we can today. So how about if we get started? Welcome, everyone, um, to our first keynote and our Design Excellence Conference 2022. Um, this session is called Designing for Intersectionality and Inclusion. And I'm going to turn things over to our AIA Austin president, Camille Job in a minute to introduce Ifoma Ebo. Just a little bit of housekeeping. If you are signed in with a generic email address like info at or conference room at, um, please rename yourself so that we can make sure to give you CE credit. And um, you can do that by placing the cursor over your name click more and then rename. And um, uh, that's it. Okay, Camille, I'm gonna turn it over to you. And um, here we go. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the uh, 2022 first live in-person uh, conference, Design Excellence Conference by the AIA Austin in a couple of years. We're really excited to all be together again. Um, and I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Ifoma Ebo, um, and the session is called Designing for Intersectionality and Inclusion. So um, I want to welcome all of you. This is really great to be together again after so long. And I want to give a special thanks to our sponsor today, who is the Austin Foundation for Architecture. Uh, they are supporting the conference and they continue to support AIA in most of the endeavors that we do um, throughout the year. The foundation is our sister organization and we've been working together since uh, 2007. And we are working together to establish a center for design here in Austin. So please go to their table when we get to the live uh, convention tomorrow in the Central Library Event Center. They will be open tomorrow and Friday, and they can give you lots of information about the foundation if you have any questions about the center that we're working on and all of the amazing public facing programs that they do every day. So thank you, Austin Foundation for Architecture. On to the speaker. Uh, we have uh, a really incredible speaker today visiting us from New York. Her name is Efoma Ebo. And uh, she has, she is experienced in an experienced urban designer and strategist who transforms urban spaces into platforms for equity and design excellence, which goes great with this conference. Um, through leadership roles in urban design and development initiatives funded by the United Nations, FIFA, and the New York City Mayor's Office, she's managed multidisciplinary teams towards the planning and implementation of projects supporting racial, social, and cultural equity. She's currently an adjunct professor at Syracuse and Columbia University, where she teaches about the intersection of urban design and equity. She is the founding director of Creative Urban Alchemy and a consultant on equitable urban design and sustainable development strategy for city governments, and civic institutions internationally. So welcome, Ifoma. I cannot wait to hear what you have to share with us today. Um, and there's only one more note for the audience. If you would like to put your questions in the chat, we'll be monitoring it as we go along and we will get to a Q&A at the end of the uh, presentation. So welcome. I hand it Thank off you. to you. Thank you so much, Ingrid and Camille and AIA Austin for the honor of being invited to speak at your Design Excellence Conference. Um, I'm really quite excited to share um, some of my work and the work of the organizations that I've worked for. And um, I am, hello everyone. I am um, zooming in from 
the unceded lands of the Wabanaki people, um, which is also known as Portland, Maine. Um, I am I am and live I, I live and, and work in Brooklyn, New York, which is also the unceded lands of the Lenape people. So I just wanted to acknowledge the lands that I'm on. And um, I will share my screen. Are you seeing the correct screen? I am seeing um, more than just your presentation slide. Okay, hold on. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, are you seeing the correct screen now? Perfect. Okay, are you seeing the correct screen now? Yes. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Awesome. Um, again, thank you again for inviting me. Um, so I teach at a number of schools. I teach at the intersection of urban design and equity. And I, um, I teach that at Columbia Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation, Syracuse Architecture, Cornell University Architecture, as well as University of Virginia Architecture. Quite excited to share this work with you. Um, so I, I consider myself an advocate um, for design justice, for more inclusive design. Um, I'm trained as an architect and as a planner, and I, I advocate for this in the, when I teach, I teach future designers and planners. Um, I also advocate for this in, the, in my actual work and engagement and design, um, also in public speaking in venues such as this with all of you. And I think it's important for to do that to sort of you know encourage this work moving forward. Um, I also strive for advocacy in my role as uh, a board member for the AIA in New York, and um, really um, love you know being being a, a voice for change in that space. And so when I talk about intersectionality, um, I'll just talk a bit about myself. You know, you can see very obviously that I'm a, I'm a black woman, I'm a woman, I'm a black person. Um, and perhaps even from my name, Ifoma Ebo, you can tell that I'm, I'm, a first, I'm a first generation American actually. My mother is an immigrant. And so all of these identities that I hold, they influence the way in which I experience the world, the way in which I experience public spaces, open spaces, um, just architecture, just the built environment in general. And so just, you know, my upbringing, experiencing the city with, with my mother as, a, as a, um, an immigrant to the United States, it influenced the ways in which the perspectives that I have. And so intersectionality is, a term that was coined by a, a lawyer, an environmental justice lawyer, Kimberly Crenshaw. And she was working in the space of environmental justice, but you know, intersectionality she defines as the idea that people experience discrimination differently depending on their overlapping identities. So myself as a, as a woman, as a black person, as a, as a child of an immigrant, um, I experienced discrimination differently. And, also, and then so the, the ways in which the built environment has been used to discriminate, I also experience those as well. And the communities that share my identity, that share and oh, other overlapping identities will experience the compounding effects of discrimination as well. So I wanted to sort of like highlight that just in terms of like the, the lens within which the work that I talk about. So a bit about my firm, uh, Creative Urban Alchemy is my own consultancy. Um, I focus on urban design and urban planning. And I, I use a process, of, uh, you know, a, a various process to engage with communities, to develop design strategies, to develop placemaking strategies. The first is really codifying, or really codifying problems with community. And so we often can come into a community, come into a place, you know, understand a site, and define what the problem is ourselves, but it's important to really engage with the experts of a place, community, to define what that problem is. And then co-design, really create interactive ways of designing to involve community and people in the process of designing, de de defining values and principles that will then guide the work moving forward. And then co-creation, really at the scale of placemaking, really creating opportunities where community can be involved in the making of place and stewarding 
and management and operations of place as well. And all of this in an, in an effort to create a sense of collective ownership. And this is a, an approach that can, can feed into many uh, different ways of thinking about justice, whether it's restorative justice, climate, environmental justice, racial justice, place-based justice, um, and also feed into an, an equitable urban design and planning approach. So I wanna to return to a, a speech by Whitney M. Young in 1968, and he's a civil rights leader um, during that era. And, and this was in Portland, Oregon. And, um, and so this was a 1968 AIA convention. And it's really quite interesting that, you know, during that era, when well, the civil rights movement was at its highest, and for many of you who may not know, the essence of the civil rights movement was that it was a built environment issue you know, separate and unequal communities and places and spaces and people fighting for the ability to have quality living environments. And so he, he reprimands architects at that time. He, it, you know, it wasn't a, you know, happy-go-lucky um, lecture uh, or um, speech. He was telling us as an industry that you are most, most distinguished by your thunderous silence and your complete irrelevance. So here was the, the, the country was burning. Um, people were fighting for their rights around built environment issues and architects and planners were silent. They were complicit in creating these um, you know, separate and unequal environments, but they were silent in, in terms of advocating for change. And he says, we didn't just suddenly get this situation. It was carefully planned. And so you know, the question is, what is this situation that he was talking about and what exactly was carefully planned? And so I want to talk a little bit. I want to take some time to talk historically about what the conditions were that he was talking about that needed to be changed, that we needed to be advocates for, that actually still persists today. And so essentially, white supremacy is a spatial practice. And so when I say white supremacy, I'm talking about the sort of the understanding or the, the ways in which, of, in the ways of working in which whiteness is sort of the dominant paradigm that we think about. It's sort of the, 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 um, the default uh, profile or identity that we're designing for. And we may do this with awareness, or we may do this unaware, but it's really been socialized into all of us. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes white supremacy can be, you know, sort of cringe when you hear that term, but really it's ingrained into everything that we do because its country was built on that, on that paradigm. And so this is a, a red line map of Austin, Texas, and um, there are red line maps like this for every major city across the country. And what's interesting about these red line maps, they're also known as homeowners loan corporation maps. They were created in the 1920s and 30s. And this was a way to sort of determine, this was created between a partnership between um, mortgage companies, banks, um, government. It was a way to determine which were areas that were, um, that were more suitable for investment and which were areas that were not suitable for investment. So the areas that are marked in blue and green um, were areas that were, um, high quality. Um, perhaps they were not located near factories or in low-lying areas. Um, there were white communities that were living there. So those were marked as, as green and blue. So if you wanted to get a loan or a mortgage in that area, you could get one with ease. If you were a Black person, you could not live in those areas. The, red, the areas that were marked as red and yellow, those were areas where Black people lived. There were areas where um, other people of color and immigrants also lived. And so they were marked red specifically for that fact, the fact that there were black people living there. Um, but, and they were termed as hazardous. So, so spaces of blackness were termed as hazardous. Um, they, they may also have been near low lying areas, areas that flooded easily, et cetera, and so forth. So if you were in those areas and you tried to get a mortgage or a loan, you could not. So you can imagine that if your home broke down or tore apart in some form of fashion in the future, you could not get a loan to upgrade your house. And so this map persisted for about 30 to 40 years. And you can imagine the ways in which it impacted the environments, um, the physical environments of those communities over that, that span of time. Even though we don't use this map today, you can actually see in many cities across the country, the difference, the, the visual difference between those communities that were marked red and yellow and those communities that were marked green and blue. And so a lot of this legacy of inequity and inequality in our communities really stem 
from that map and a number of other decisions that were made along the way in, the, in terms of land use, in terms of built environment over time. Um, during the 50s and 60s, we had um, white flight from the inner cities towards the suburbs. And this was sort of when the country was sort of establishing um, this upper middle class. And, and also the car became important for people to get around and also just as a, as a, as a symbol of status in the country. And so this, the, the, the suburbs that were created um, there were a lot of exclusion around it, exclusionary zoning. So you couldn't have industrial commercial development. You couldn't have low-income housing. So that right there um, was class-based exclusion, which in, at that time, class and race were very much interlinked. And so if you were a Black person, if you were a low-income person, you could not live in this environment. It was not for you. It was for you only if you were upper middle class with at, at that time was white. And so, and so even into the, to make this more sustainable, um, those who had homes in the suburbs, they were, there were covenants written into your deeds so that to prevent you to be able to sell your home or rent it to a black person. And so this persisted for a number of decades. And so again, from, 20, from the twenties to the sixties, there was this period of time where there was sort of a holding back of black people, of communities of color from being able to build generational wealth and all through the uses of land uses and the built environment. And then on top of that, you had single family zoning that was, that was used outside of the suburbs, that was used also in you know, inner cities to create further exclusion. So um, homes that were built in single family zonings, you had a minimum lot size, you couldn't build in your backyard if you had it to expand your family. Um, you could not build multifamily housing. You, they banned mobile and prefabricated homes. So again, this was a way of excluding certain classes from being able to access this type of um, building and, and living environment. And then the ways in which the built environment practitioners were complicit um, behind um, urban planners and designers were hired to designate separate areas, withhold building permits, create commercial and industrial buffers. These are all built environment tools. These are all the things that we do. Um, and they were used to further promote this very exclusive and separatist and segregationist approach to the built environment. Um, and then further, this is, you might recognize this uh, interstate highway, Interstate 35, is one example of one of the many freeways and highways built across this country during the 50s and 60s as a result of the Interstate Highway Act um, to connect the different states and cities. Um, but they were used and they were, the, the, the red line areas were the areas where those those freeways were cut right through. So many communities of color, immigrant communities, low-income communities were split into two, severing community ties, connections, people, their homes leveled. This was sort of a way to economically, further economically disenfranchise um, communities of color. And so we know that power relations are very much connected to property relations. If your environment is not doing well physically, it really reflects on you and your sense of empowerment, your sense of your ability to be able to affect change in your community. But I love this quote by Mario Gooden, who's a colleague of mine at um, Columbia. Um, he wrote a book called Dark Space, and he says, liberation is a spatial practice. You know, the same tools that have been used to oppress and segregate can also be used to create more inclusive environments and also just like ignite a sense of liberation for all of us. And so now that I've talked a little bit about where we've come from, I want to talk a bit about how we can strive for a more just urban future. And what I propose is that you know, design justice is a tool to use that. And it, and this is a, you know, the, the, the words in white are from by Cornell West, an academic. Um, and it says justice is what love looks like in public. And I propose that design justice is what love looks like in public spaces. And so a, a dear friend of mine, Brian Lee, an architect in New Orleans, he has a firm named Colocate Design. And he has this definition for design justice that really talks about the fact that it it forwards the efforts of racial, social, and cultural reparation. So essentially, equitable design is, is really the aim and goal of design justice. And furthermore, it seeks to challenge privilege and power structures. So all the structures that I've mentioned to you before, all the ways in which the built environment has been used to oppress 
to disenfranchise, design justice strives, like the, the purpose and intention is to challenge those power structures um, that use architecture as a tool for oppression. And so there, and, and this is sort of the theory of change of design justice created by co-locate design, uh, five, uh, five key principles that I will use to sort of frame many of the projects I'm gonna share with you today. Uh, the first is challenge existing power structures, amplify existing expertise, build collective power in communities, lift up histories of place, and envision space that serves the marginalized. So the first principle is disrupt power. How might we challenge existing power structures? I start with power disruption. The, the key, this key principle focuses on structures and institutions of power. The same way that the built environment has and is used disproportionately to, to disproportionately distribute power, it can also be used to achieve racial, social, and cultural equity. So how do we work with our client institutions to use the design process to rethink their missions and values? Are we centering equity in the decision-making behind our space programming? Is there a design justice expert on your team or in your office that brings this insight into your projects? Um, how might we use the project as a testing ground for innovation and in design and spatial justice? How might we, um, what is defined as innovation in your organization be shaped by a white cultural lens? Would your black and brown staff say they truly get tapped on to think of innovative ideas and approaches? Um, what can your organization do to clear space for their ideas to be heard? And so I wanna talk a bit about Dark Matter University, which is an organization that was started in 2020 by a network of um, academics of color across the country. And we started this as a way of disrupting power structure in academia and really transforming the way that architecture is taught to just students in general. And really, but through the lens of understanding that you know, there's great cultural diversity in built form, in built form practice over time and and students should be exposed to all of that and not just eurocentric architecture and, and planning but you know the ways in which it's done in, in many different in many different contexts um, and then also the ex exposing and exploring the ways in which the built environment has been used as a tool of injustice and so this was kind of one of the aims and goals of the um, of dark matter university So the, the mission for, for DMU for short is that it's an anti-racist design justice school collectively seeking the radical transformation of education and practice towards a just future. Um, we, it's found, it was founded to work inside and outside of existing systems. So we, we create courses and curriculum um, with, with schools, we partner with schools, um, but then we also create um, programs and, and, and courses outside of academia um, that people can also sign up for. And so the mission of, of DMU, Dark Matter University, is really, it's, it's five parts. You know, we're really thinking about new forms of knowledge and knowledge reduction, because this is, is new territory, new forms of institutions. So how can we build ourselves up so that we can feel empowered to educate the future practitioners? New forms of collectivity and practice. So co-creating with students, new ways of working and operating in this space of design justice, new forms of community and culture, um, you know, sort of the ways in which we work together and new forms of, and all of this in effort to create new forms of design. You can find out more about Dark Matter um, University at darkmatteruniversity.org. And so the way that this shows up for me in my teaching is um, bringing together residents, youth in community with architecture students that are studying to co-create ideas, to co-define solutions, to co-define and understand the problem. And so community members become advocates in a design studio and they also become co-creators with students. And students gain the experience of working with community, of understand, being able to relay their design ideas to community and understanding that you know some of the architectural jargon you have to set aside when engaging with community so things are clear and accessible. 
And so what has been the result um, in terms of the design projects has been, you know, students re reimagining spaces under freeways and highways that were built to cut through communities and reimagining those spaces as places where community can come together and learn about the history and heritage of a, of a, of a place. Um, or underneath freeways or elevated train lines, those spaces, those dark spaces can be used as a place to build um, entrepreneurship and collective ownership. Um, that spaces around public housing that are just unused can also create spaces for joy, for people to celebrate, come together, recreation, and, and, and collective stewardship. Um, that these spaces in between buildings can also be the places where um, co-creation uh, co of art can happen as a form of uh, collective ownership. Um, that spaces underneath freeways can also be spaces where perhaps um, community gardens can be created and cultivated to address food justice. And then, you know, in one, this is one example where a student was looking at the, the, um, the heritage of African American heritage quilt making and really thinking about how quilt making can be an, an approach to creating um, a, a way of making architecture or a way of, of adorning a building. Um, um, on a street. So when people are walking on that street, they can see a sense of themselves, their own culture reflected in the built environment. So when thinking about power disruption, consider how you're developing new forms of design that address past harms in the built environment, rethinking building programming, inclusive of spaces that can empower community and transform institutional practice and creating new methods of design practice that includes marginalized voices. So the next prompt for you was to think about how we might use design and its process to build power in communities. When thinking about an, an ethic of care, a few questions come to mind. Primarily, do we create environments that encourage people to care for each other or build power or shift power or, or, or form new networks? Um, I wanna go into a project that I worked on for three years um, while I was a design advisor, the first in-house design advisor for the New York City Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. We worked across 15 public housing communities across New York City. And these were also communities that were formerly redlined neighborhoods. And so there was a, a, a legacy of just distrust of government in these communities. And so the, the project was really striving to build trust through the process of transforming public spaces around public housing. And so as a, as a form of building power, we actually trained residents. We trained resident teams at each of these public housing developments. Um, we trained them in placemaking, human center design, um, crime prevention through environmental design. And we were really striving to train them in crime prevention through environmental design, also known as SEPTED, as a way of helping them understand the ways in which built environment has been used as a tool to promote aggressive law enforcement and really pushing them to think about alternate ways, alternate approaches to addressing crime prevention in their communities that were not punitive, that were not really looking at um, people as, as um, criminals, but really see that, understand that there, there's victimization that leads to criminality. And, um, and oftentimes when crime occurs in communities like these, they may know who's committing those crimes. They may understand the history of that person and how they've been victimized and over time, how they've experienced oppression. And so there may be other approaches to um, addressing, to collective problem solving. And so this, the, this project was really about building social cohesion in community so that they could collectively problem solve. And we started with mapping helping people understand maps and how to understand the ge geography of their community. Um, they created these heat maps um, in partnership with the Center for Court Innovation and the colors um, differentiated different um, undesired activity from public urination in yellow to substance sale and abuse in red. And so this was, these were maps that were created by community themselves. And so they also created these maps where they had positive activity that was occurring. So where were, were senior citizens hanging out? Where were youth hanging out? And, and having conversations about how to shift those positive activities to areas where negative activity, activities were occurring. And we know the power is a chameleon. It takes on the texture of an environment. So if a community, if you're, if you're um, building more, um, 
spaces where people feel more empowered, that they can create themselves and steward themselves, that's a sense of empowerment. Um, that's you know the, the transformation of those places that also strive to build power. This is one example of one of the projects from this program. This is in um, Stapleton in Staten Island, Stapleton Houses in Staten Island, and this is a tennis court. You can see that tennis is not the sport of choice in this neighborhood. You can see that there are you know, trash bags in the corner. There's no tennis net, there's no tennis rackets anywhere. And so what the, the resident team in this, in this development, what they were experiencing was that this space was being used for substance abuse, substance sale as well. But there were also issues of mental health challenges in the community and sort of the underlying um, problems around crime. And so they wanted to get to that root cause and they wanted to transform this space as a place, as a resource hub where um, they could actually bring organizations to their neighborhood and in order to share resources to support communities on addressing mental health abuse, abuse to, to addressing um, substance abuse. And so they worked with architecture students at Columbia to craft the, this vision um, for what they wanted for this space, for this resource hub they wanted to create. And so they, they wound up working with the local artists to create the kiosks that will then be rolled out into this um, tennis court and you know created a whole you know a place making aspect of it an activation aspect of it so that it limited opportunities for criminal activity to occur in this space when there was this resource hub happening and so the resource hub also brought forth nonprofit organizations government entities to bring resources to have nutritional um, uh, trainings to provide information on mental health support substance abuse support and so it they were building power through the transformation of this space. This was a way that they were able to connect to a network of organizations and government agencies that were willing and able and excited to support them. And this is power building. This is what it is to build power through the use of public space. And so when thinking about building power, um, we need to think about how do we actually, through the engagement process, support networking for communities. Um, support knowledge sharing and information because knowledge um, is empowering and providing information is empowering where people can be able to use that information to advocate for themselves in the future. And then also creating opportunities for co-design where community can be involved in the designing process, realize and connect their lived experience to this language of design and, and, and making. So, when thinking about strengthening power, how do you lift up the history and culture of space? Um, how might we create more welcoming environments for different cultural narratives and people? How might we integrate the cultural heritage of the surrounding neighborhood into our design interventions? How might we better understand the historical narratives of place that can anchor greater value in place? And what can we learn about the histories of injustice in the neighborhood that can be addressed? through the, your design interventions. And then also how might we better understand the positive and negative narratives of place? So I wanna share um, another organization that I'm a part of. This is uh, the Black Space Urbanist Collective. I was a part of uh, co-founding this nonprofit organization in 2016. And we are a collective of Black architects, urbanists, planners, you know, multidisciplinary practitioners, passionate about working in, with, and for Black communities. We demand a present and future where Black people, Black spaces, and Black culture matter and thrive. And we understand that cities are dynamic and they require multidisciplinary, multidisciplines to work together to collectively solve problems. And we want to do that in an, empower, in an empowering way for black communities. So this is a this is sort of a constellation of how we're structured and how we build power for ourselves so that we can support power building in communities. We start with the back, black publics at the center of our constellation and we support back, black publics in a number of different ways whether it's through publishing content content and articles and and in the press develop co-developing neighborhood strategies with community um, crafting urbanist experiences for people to better understand um, communities of color, um, and also developing customized learnings. We have affiliates in Chicago, in Oklahoma, in Indianapolis, and um, and, and growing, and in Atlanta, and, and, and growing, and also in New York City. Um, we also work within a, a structure of, we have committees for communication, governance, programming, content, um, 
And so this is the way that we build power for ourselves so that we can sustain the work that we're doing over time. And so there's, I just wanna talk about one project that we did, which is in Brownsville, Brooklyn, which is the historic African-American community. Um, and we were really thinking about the, the fact that, you know, can, residents were afraid that gentrification was sort of on the horizon. There was a lot of public investment coming into this neighborhood. And so people were afraid that all the changes was gonna sort of push them out. And so we were thinking, you know, what is one way that we could sort of really support this community around issues of gentrification? And one of the challenges of gentrification is that people get displaced, leaders get displaced, culture gets erased in the, in the effort of of you know, creating new environments. And so we wanted to really think about how can we promote cultural conservation in this neighborhood? Like really the, the ways in which Brownsville celebrates itself. So we went and we listened, and we, we sort of were on this like year long journey um, funded by JM Kaplan Fund. Um, we were on this year long journey of just like uncovering what, we didn't know what the end product was going to be, but we just, we knew that, that we, cultural conservation was sort of the path that we wanted to go on. So we listened to neighborhood stories. We engaged with existing community activations. We went to where people were. We, we brought a map of Brownsville wherever we went and had people map the places that they felt safe, where they felt free and they experienced joy. Um, and we made sure that the funding that we had, that majority of that funding was went to local businesses to support local businesses. So we went, really wanted to ensure that equity and justice were in every aspect of our work. And so we also sort of like explored what are the ways that Brownsville is, is commemorating place, commemorating legacies and leaders. They had uh, writing circles, they had public murals, they had street naming and build naming, building naming, they had summits, parades, events. These were the ways that they were conserving their heritage and oftentimes done in silos, not really done together. Um, and so then we also started to, to craft a set of principles for ourselves that we'll hold, we will hold ourselves accountable to. Um, and so we, we, thinking about things like, you know, moving at the speed of trust, making sure that people trust us before we move to the next stage of a project, um, amplifying, amplifying Black joy because of the history that I've mentioned before of just the ways in which Black communities have been disenfranchised amplifying black joy was so important to sort of anything that we were doing in black communities. And so this was kind of the paradigm within which we were working. And so, you know, our work was very iterative. It was very cyclical. We, we reflected, we co-developed ideas, we co-created with communities. We made sure to listen, to learn, to prototype through activation in public space and, and continuously went on this cycle as we were um, doing our work. And so what along the way, the ways in which we prototyped ideas were to work with young people in public space to test out ways that, you know, culture could be um, represented in the built environment, um, whether it's through transforming public seating or creating new opportunities for education in public space, and also working with children and understanding how do they want to, to improve the spaces in their community. And so what the result was, um, of this, of this work over the course of the year was the Black Space Manifesto, which is a set of 14 principles. You can find it on the website, blackspace.org. It's a set of 14 principles that we were holding ourselves accountable to, but once we made it um, open source for everyone, it became, it went viral. And it became something that was really exciting people um, around when, when working with um, Black communities. And it really is a set of 14 principles to provide guidance to practitioners working in Black communities. And you can find it on Blackspace, um, blackspace.org. And so, you know, when thinking about strengthening power in the communities, how do you lift up the history in place? You know, you wanna to listen to community stories. That's where the lived experience comes out. That's where you understand place, who place is, the identity of place. Engage cultural producers. So all the people that are creating the murals and the festivals and the summits and the events and the street namings, these are cultural producers. These are the, the people that are producing the events and functions of culture in the community and be inspired by existing cultural heritage. Because oftentimes as architects and planners, when we're designing new spaces, we are complicit in this gentrification. But once you begin to think of ways that those community stories and cultural artifacts and assets can be integrated or supported through this new design project, you are actually working towards strengthening power in that community. So the next prompt is, is healing power. How might we envision spaces that serve 
marginalized communities. So how might we integrate the many different voices into the work that we're doing um, and, and, really, and, and really amplify those, those voices as well? So this is um, in New York City when dealing with criminal, um, you know, rise in crime in certain neighborhoods. This is sort of the, the sort of like the quick, fast solution that we do. We put these uh, floodlights throughout the city, and oftentimes they're mostly located around public housing. And it, it's it's an environmental injustice for this to be located anywhere, I would say, but primarily in, in, in public housing, especially because of the legacy of injustice that I've explained before. Um, but the floodlights are really extremely bright. And you know, a, a, a study was done by Crime Lab that showed that floodlights actually decreased the quality, uh, that decreased criminal activity in communities um, over time. However, what the Crime Lab study didn't acknowledge was that it decreased a lot of things such as barbecuing in, in public space, enjoyment in public space, hopscotching in public space, just general, just enjoyment of open space because these um, floodlights, they have engines and they're extremely loud. So if you screamed, you wouldn't even be able to hear yourself scream, let alone just have hold a conversation. They're really bright. They shine into the living rooms and bedrooms of people's homes. And so, as I mentioned before, it's an environmental injustice. It's a hazard to have these um, around in communities and there are different ways that we can really think about lighting that can be more innovative that can be, be more empowering for our communities and so um, when I worked for the mayor's office of criminal justice we held this competition in partnership with the mayor's office of technology and we and the competition was to encourage um, tech entrepreneurs to partner with community-based organizations to come up with new solutions for lighting and um, you know nightlife in community and so this, um, this partnership between uh, Brownsville Partnership, culture, um, people's culture, and the Brownsville Community Justice Center, they empowered young people to be leaders in transforming public spaces. So they trained them in coding so that they could be a part of creating new tech tools for public space. They also worked, brought in Arab, um, as, uh, which is a, you know, a world-renowned uh, engineering firm to work with children in the community to, to create lanterns that would also go in public space as a way of lighting up the night. And so this is a rendering that was created by the teenagers in the community, really reimagining what a dead end uh, space in their neighborhood could look like in Brownsville and really thinking about ways that they could use their own artwork to project their own cultural identity in public space so that as they're in that space, they're seeing themselves reflected in their built environment. And so what re resulted from this competition is that youth were empowered as leaders in transforming public space. They worked with a tech entrepreneur to create this, these um, projections into public space. They, they um, attached a projector onto a light pole. They also attached LED lamp, um, lamps, lights onto light poles, and they were all sensor-based. So the more people visited those spaces, the more those lights lit up. Um, the more people visited this space, the more the projections fluttered in public space. So people got to see the work of the young people. They all came out because it was an amazing spectacle. It was the work of their children. And it was just, you know, it really just like encouraged people to and be, get excited about coming out into public space because they saw the artwork of their young people. They saw themselves reflected in the built environment. And it was an empowering experience for all. And then so now thinking about a different scale, um, I spent a few years working for the Department of Housing Preservation and Development in New York City, developing affordable housing across New York City, planning and developing affordable housing across New York City. And so this is one uh, such project by uh, in partnership between the New York City Housing Authority, the Housing Development Corporation and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, Arbor Housing in the South Bronx. And the South Bronx, the history of, of this, this um, area is very similar to the history that I'd mentioned before, where there, um, there was a legacy of redlining, legacy of urban renewal, a legacy of, of a highways cut, you know, dividing through a community. Um, and this resulted in just an issue around food um, injustice in this neighborhood. Um, there are poor levels of um, community gardening or even grocery stores or the availability of of quality food in this neighborhood. And so in, in this, in this um, project, 
the architects and developers, they were aware of this history. They researched this history and they really wanted to um, really incorporate ideas that grappled and reckoned with that history. And so one thing that they did was they, in the open spaces, they designed all of them to really focus on health and, and wellness. So building spaces where people could exercise and um, really come together through the transformation of their physical health. And so they understood the importance of building physical health as a, as a way of reckoning with that history. And then on the, the rooftop of the, of the house, there's 9,000 square feet, feet of um, aquaponics community garden where people can come and be stewards of this space and really work, work together in this hydroponic farm and greenhouse, which is first of its kind in the country. Um, in sites like these, this where residents in the community at large lack access to affordable, healthy food, integrating food production into affordable housing has potential to provide local jobs and improve access to nutritious food. And what I appreciate most about this building is that it's that it's embedded in its design, a mission that centers the need of needs of community. It reckons with a history of food injustice and fosters a sense of care for individual and collective health. So something, this is something to think about um, as a mission for your next project. Are you reckoning with the past and centering needs of the most vulnerable in your designs? So when thinking about healing power and envisioning spaces for marginalized communities, let's think about spaces for co community stewardship where people can come together and, and transform spaces or steward those spaces, um, address community health, because this legacy of, of redlining and, and urban renewal has impacted the future ability for people to um, em, em, be empowered in their health um, and wellness and engage youth because the youth are the future. The spaces that we create are spaces for the future, the spaces that they will stand to benefit from. And so involve them in the co-creation of the spaces that they will use in their futures. So um, the, the next prompt for you is share power. How might we amplify existing expertise? So how might your future project be a testing ground for innovation and design and justice? How might you think about the ways in which your black and brown staff are truly tapped to think through innovative ideas and approaches? How can your organization create space for their ideas to be heard? How might you share that power in your own office um, and even in the work that you do? So here are some images from my upbringing. Um, I was born and raised in Park Slope, Brooklyn. Um, right now, Park Slope has been fully gentrified and so it's no longer the neighborhood of my, my youth, but these are three schools that are, these are three buildings that are, I'm fond of because they're the buildings of my youth. The building on the top right is my elementary school, PS39. The building on the top left is my high school, high, um, John Jay High School. Um, and the building on the bottom is the library that I went to. It was across the street from my elementary school. So I went there like almost every day after school. But you can see that there is some like relationship between the buildings. There's a sort of architectural style that sort of um, permeates all of them, this red brick and a classical style of architecture. Um, but then I'll show you some other buildings. These are also two buildings in, in New York City. The one on the left-hand side is a juvenile detention center. And the one on the right is um, a jail in, in Brooklyn. And so you can also see that the architectural style, there's a similarity between these buildings and the buildings of my neighborhood growing up. So there's a, there's a, there's a relationship between these buildings for criminal justice, for, for sort of like crimin, for criminals, to, where criminals are being placed. Or, or detained, um, and the spaces for socialization for youth. And so I spent time working for the Department of Design and Construction. And this was something that we were feeling very challenged by, that we had this sort of like legacy of, of public buildings in our city that were showing um, children that there's no, there's a, there's a relationship between these spaces of criminal justice and um, spaces of, of socialization. And so as a part of this work, we were striving to further articulate guiding principles for design excellence, uh, focusing on equity, sustainability, resilience, and healthy living. But we, my work was really centered on the equity part. Like how could we really define what equity meant for designing public buildings and public infrastructure across New York City? And so we wanted to have this do research that was really involving 
the public and communities, particularly marginalized voices in this co-creation of defining what were equity principles that we would, we would work on. So we held a number of, of workshops um, throughout the city to, to really ask people questions like, you know, how can the design of public buildings and spaces allow users to feel entitled and invited to use it? I mean, our public buildings, that's the, these are the type of buildings that you'll find in every neighborhood, schools, hospitals, um, community centers, libraries, et cetera, and so forth. And so all the more important that they all should feel inviting because these are the places where we all access our government resources and services. So how can the other questions we asked were how can we provide opportunities for people to gather with others or to improve access to services? And so this, this questioning and research really helped us um, come together with five key principles. The first being convey a sense of welcome to all. So make sure that, you know, even that just the outside of the building itself welcomes people in and makes them feel like invited. Um, and that can be done in a number of ways. And then also ease access to resources. So anyone who has any either physical impediments or language barriers that they're able to actually come in and access the resources and services that that building provides. Also, um, buildings that strengthen communities that really support people coming together and building social cohesion. Um, buildings that respect histories and cultures and evolve with, with need and change. So this is a library that was done that was uh, in East Flatbush, which is another formerly redlined community. And, um, And um, you can see that it looks like a bunker. It's not very inviting. You wouldn't want to go into this building. It looks like a place where you should be setting up and preparing for war. Um, and so this firm, 11 Bets, they transformed the facade of this building to really transform it so that you can feel comfortable, invited to, to, to enter this building because you can actually see what's happening inside and get excited about the activity that's happening inside. And then also while you're inside, you can see what's happening outside and feel a lot safer. Um, to be in this building. And it's a, it's a more inviting experience and, and really allows people to, um, to feel welcome to come into their neighborhood library. So for the past four years, I've also served as a global advisor for the mayor of Helsingborg, Sweden, um, their global uh, advisory board for their um, H22 Expo, which was an expo that they held this past June. I was just there in June for the expo. And so they've been working on it for four years, um, which is an expo that uses technology to transform public space and to improve the quality of life for people in Sweden and Helsingborg, Sweden. What's interesting about Hel Helsingborg is that maybe about five to 10 years ago, they opened their borders to refugees from the Middle East. And so over the past five to 10 years, they've had a growing population of Middle Eastern refugees in their, in their community. Um, but what they didn't consider is how do we use our built environment to be more inclusive of this community? They didn't consider that. And so as a result, they were experiencing social tensions. And so this, you know, this expo, you know, part of it was really thinking about how can we be more inclusive in our public spaces, in our public buildings. And so as a part of this expo, they were really using public spaces as a way of, of doing that, of really tinkering with and um, um, and, and, and sort of practicing this, this way of, of transforming public spaces to be more inclusive. And so as a part of our Global Advisory Board, we suggested and recommended that we, they hold a competition, that co-creation be a critical part of this expo, ways that people can be involved in the making of space or place making. So this was a, a competition winner, um, Lund University School of Architecture. They created this hollow space that was called the People's Voice. And so these were all made of bottle can holders and each of the bottle can holders you were able to write a note in and put it inside the bottle and the note for you would be what does equity or what does equality mean for you it was a place for people to to share their voice on thinking about equality in Helsingborg and then eventually those notes would be sandblasted into concrete and the, 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 the containers, the bottle containers would then be replaced with concrete. And so you can imagine this hollow space as it moves around the city, giving people opportunity to share their voice, to, to, to sort of like um, uh, be an advocate for their community, that then it would transform over time and be made out of concrete that then reflects all the thoughts and sentiments of the people of, of Helsingborg in different languages as well. So it was sort of a, a reflection of the inclusivity. 
Um, they also have these pop-up spaces around um, Helsenberg by architects Crook and Jagger, Jadder um, that were also made for co-creating ideas and brainstorming. And they were also places where people could connect to, um, the, to Wi-Fi and internet. So it was a really welcoming space where people could use to build social cohesion. Um, and they were pop up, they popped up all over town and they were also really safe spaces for women as well to go and, and you know, collect ideas or just re for respite. So this was their way of, of really instilling a sense of inclusion and, and co-creating ideas in their city. So when thinking about sharing power, how might you amplify existing expertise, create a set of design principles, co-create that with community, and then use those design principles to influence the work that you're doing. Also design opportunities for co-creation, ways that people can be involved in the making of place or making of ideas about place. So I wanna end with this wonderful quote by Adrian Marie Brown, who was a writer of Emergent Strategy. And she says, we must imagine new worlds that transition ideologies and norms so that no one sees black people as murderers or brown people as terrorists and aliens, but all of us as potential cultural and economic innovators. This is a time travel exercise for the heart. This is the collaborative ideation. What are the ideas that will liberate all of us? And I'm excited about this quote because I see myself as an architect and planner. I see myself as um, engaged in time travel exercise. I'm designing for the future. We're all designing for the future. And so we're not designing for tomorrow. And so our work is a time travel exercise and all the more important for us to reflect in our visualizations that black and brown people are um, cultural and economic innovators. You can see in this image on the left-hand side done by Olale Kanjeofus, who is an architect and artist based in Brooklyn, New York. He creates these amazing, amazing future visualizations. And you can see that there are two black men standing on the corner. And today that could be perceived as a criminal activity by some, but in his visualizations, he's created a whole world where that is an, it's just, you know, it's the thing that happens. It, it, it's exciting and invites you to wanna to be a part of this vision, a part of this image and be inside that future. And so this is the thing that we are empowered to do in our work, to create visualizations of the future that everyone can connect with and buy into and be excited about. So I wanna thank all of you for this, for listening, um, for the opportunity to, to share my work and the work of the organizations that I'm a part of. Uh, I wanna leave you with three key points. The first is center equity and justice in your work. Um, you know, thinking about ways that you can build power, share power, disrupt power, um, co-create values with community and use those values and principles as a, as a, as a, to hold yourself accountable in the work and to the, their needs and desires. And also move at the speed of trust, move at the speed of which the people will stand to benefit from the work that you're doing, that they trust the process. They trust that the outcomes of the process, the design product is gonna to stand to benefit them and reflect them and their ideas and their dreams as well. So thank you again to AIA Austin for this um, opportunity to share and I really look forward to the Q&A. Hi, that was great. Um, that was a really, really full presentation. I had questions that I was noting myself, but the Q&A has been popping up. So I'm gonna ask um, a few of those questions so we can hear from some of our listeners. Um, one person has a question about uh, wage being the legitimate fruit of work. And you seem to be doing a lot of pro bono and volunteer um, compensation for your work, your team, the community members involved in the projects, et cetera. Any recommendations for types of finding resources, equitable pay policies, labor issues, as we try to step up in these challenges? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, when I, um, I now have a practice of when I am working on a project to let them know ahead of time, let clients know, partners know that, you know, we need to set aside budget for stipends for people who are involved in the project. So whether it's through focus groups or surveys or, um, you know, involvement in the process, in the engagement process, we, we definitely need to make sure that there are stipends included in that so people, so we can recognize that community are coming with their own lived experience, that they all are also experts in the process. And we can even form an advisory um, committee that will support the work that we're doing. So, you know, I, I think that's a, that's a great 
great question. I think, you know, some of the, the ways, I think that the main way is really thinking about engaging clients around that and helping them to understand that, um, you know, community are experts, they're also consultants um, and that they should be paid or they should provide stipends for, for that work. Thanks yeah. for that question. Okay, we have, um, I didn't mention everyone was saying wonderful presentation as well, but we do have another uh, quick one. It's probably the last one we have time for. It says, do you find that today most designers and public entities on are on board with the work that you do? Uh, if you encounter resistance, how do you help overcome it? So I, I only take projects where people are on board with the work that I do. I let them know about you know, the importance of an engagement process, the importance of co-creation. And, and it comes in many different forms. And you know, it can be adjusted depending on the scale of the project, the budget of the project. So I try to fit it in, you know, in whatever way that I can. And so, and, and you know, part of that, you know, in terms of the resistance, which I haven't really experienced resistance, usually when people are coming to me to work, they are excited about a de design justice approach. They are excited about this idea of power sharing and shifting. Um, and so, yeah, I think, you know, part of it is also educating people on why it's important to do this type of process and why it's important to share power, um, especially if they're working in a community that has experienced, uh, you know, history of disenfranchisement. So, yeah. Those are great tips. Well, um, I, I hate to close things off quickly, but we ran up to exactly the last second on this. Um, thank you so much for sharing your work and uh, that you do. It, it seems like an overwhelming amount of things that you're taking on. Um, I'm sure you have a really great group of people who are helping you um, from all the angles. And I hope it's given our community here some inspiration on how to take some first steps in a good direction. Um, I also, so thank you for coming and sharing your time with us. Thank you for having um, I have a couple of other things that I need to say. One is to thank our keynote sponsor again, Austin Foundation for Architecture. Um, and please go visit the exhibitors tables Friday, uh, Thursday and Friday at the library where we're having our live conference. Um, they can give you a special code that will help you with the little game that is in the app for the conference and the high scores of this game like 10 high scores get a $50 gift certificate from Rogers O'Brien Construction. So thank you from Rogers O'Brien. Um, and I'm sorry, I darted back in before you were finished talking. You said something real quick there. Oh, no, I just said thank you for having me. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you doing this. And thank you for all your questions, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye.